The Roman Empire has been and gone, as you can see. And Christianity of the sort has arrived in the land of the British. And since the Roman withdrawal, the native British church has developed mainly under the influence of the Irish missionaries. It's had little or no influence from the church in Rome at all. It's kind of the more spiritual and less worldly Celtic type of Christianity that seems to be what the indigenous Brits have. But they don't seem to bother much trying to convert the invading pagan Germanic tribes. The Pope decides to convert the Anglo-Saxons and he dispatches Augustine on a mission to Canterbury and Kent. King Ethelbert of Kent, who has a Christian wife, converts and Augustine is able to establish a foothold for the type of highly organized and politicized Christianity that Roman Catholicism would bring. But it is Christianity nonetheless. And because the king converts, there is mass conversions to the new faith. Eventually, the Roman church leaves the de facto religion in the land, if only for a short while. And the seeds are sown for a significant part of the religious schema for our people for years to come. But Christianity is of a kind that doesn't need many to be born again of the Spirit of God. And it doesn't seem to be even existentially satisfying. It seems to be a case of political expediency with the Roman Pope being this powerful worldwide political figure. And the leaders of the land adopting the Christian God in name only because they think he's going to help them be victorious in battle over their enemies. It doesn't seem to be an issue of personal salvation. And no doubt there are some genuine conversions, but it seems it'll be about 400 years before there's anything that resembles genuine spiritual transformation among the people and a movement away from pagan practices. I might be doing them a disservice, but it seems to me that the political advantages of a converting are what Ethelbert of Kent has in mind, as well, of course, as the whispers of his Christian wife on the pillow at night. A diplomatic relationship with the dwindling power of Rome is to be desired, even if it means being subject to their spiritual control and oversight. So you see, the idea of us being part of something bigger in union with Europe or remaining detached and independent is not new politics. It's as old as the hills, man. Just about the time of Augustine's mission in the south, April Frith is the pagan king of the north, and he gets married to Acre. And just to make life complicated, Acre has a brother called Edwin of Deira. Now more why that's complicated in a minute. But April Frith and Acre have a bunch of kids, including Oswald, Ian Frith, and Oswe. Now here's where you really need to keep up. Do you remember Edwin, Acre's brother, and so Ethelfrith's brother-in-law, and so Oswald's uncle? When Ethelfrith's dad and Oswald's granddad, Ethelric, became king, Edwin was exiled, and he wandered for years until he sought refuge with King Radwell, who became Christian when he stood in Kent for a bit. Ethelfrith wanted to raise all day in opposition to his rule, and so he did his best to pursue and persecute Edwin. But Radwell protected Edwin, and they ambushed Athelfrith near Doncaster, and they killed him. Edwin was installed on the throne in Deira down there. His sister Acre, remember her? Athelfrith's wife and Oswald's mother. Well, she basically wasn't stupid, and she knew that given even half a chance, Uncle Edwin would kill his nephews and nieces and not killing the Dory family off the estates, getting for your tea or Edward or your mum will kill you sense, killing the seventh century kings and queens dagger through the eye socket sense. The Acre fled northwest of Dalriata, which is like a part of Scotland, and she took at least Oswald and Oswald to Iona, which is basically a Celtic Christian monastery. The half-brother Ainfrith went to Pickland. Oswald was 12 at the time, and Oswald's uncle Edwin becomes king of all England, except for Kent. and a Cadwallan of Gwynedd. Cadwallan is a nominal Christian, somebody who bears the label, but only for political means. It would be wonderful if it weren't so, but just like the day, it can see a Christian on the tin, but it's what's on the inside that matters. And what's inside Cadwallan 
is clearly the bad stuff. Him and Pendo and Mercia killed Edwin at the Battle of Hatfield Chase. Northumbria fell into disarray and split into Bernicia and Deere again. Then Ian Frith, Oswald's brother, comes down from Pickland and he becomes king of Bernicia and he reverts to paganism. Seems to me that not doing God isn't just a 20th century political manoeuvre. Cadwallon sets up camp here at Corbridge and then he loots all of Deira. And in a frenzy of blood and greed, he builds up a treasure trove to carry home to Gwynedd. Or maybe he even has his eyes on becoming the king of all Northumbria. Or just maybe he's seeking to wipe the Northumbrians off the face of the map altogether. So Cadwallon sits here at Corbridge with his vastly superior army and all his looted treasure. And what happens is, Ian Frith, Oswald's brother, comes and tries to make peace with Cadwallon. But what Cadwallon does is he lures him and his 12 companions into a trap and then they just kill them, stone dead. So this is the trigger for the Christian Oswald to return from his 17 year exile on Iona and make his bid to become king of all Northumbria and try to bring Christianity to his people. But what will he do? And just how will he get from Scotland to Corbridge without being seen? And how will he prevail over Cadwallon's superior forces? I'll be talking about all that in episode five. But first, to find out what God said to me in 2001 about dead bodies in the church in the UK, you'll need to watch episode four of my series, What is God saying to the UK at the start of the 21st century?